benefits of a religious way of life. I don't know how many of you have heard about some of this. Now, if you take a careful look at the literature, right, almost all the health benefits are associated with this, right? And that makes good sense. And you just think about it a few minutes because what you find is the health benefits largely vary, uh, largely are constant, even though people have very different creeds, sets of propositions that they will, that they affirm to varying degrees. So what's interesting uh, from a, a sort of a scientific point of view is why is this functioning and how is this functioning and if we understand its function is different from this, can cognitive science and neuroscience actually tell us anything significant about this religio? And here's where I want to center uh, the main thrust of my talk. I want to actually make a very strong argument for the fact that we are now on the cusp of being able to get a very, some very deep understanding of the cognitive and, neuro and neurological processes that found religio. And I want to try and show you uh, why those processes are valuable pretty much to everybody and why they're essential and why um, directly becoming aware of them and trying to cultivate them would constitute a very uh, powerful form of spirituality. Because what I'm going to try and argue is that there's going to be deep connections between this sense of what underlie the cognitive processes that underlie religio and the abilities to uh, cultivate wisdom and compassion and flow. So let's let's go and take a look at what does what can cognitive science and neuroscience tell us about this sense of logos that we have, this ability to find an underlying order. Well, this is actually, and I mean this is goes back to the ancient Greek use, right? There's actually some very deep connections between this idea of logos and attempts to understand general intelligence, what it is to be intelligent. Now, of course, you have to understand a distinction between intelligence and knowledge. Of course, knowledge is usually the possession of either sets of propositions, or else we'll talk about later, uh, skill abilities. And that's not what I mean uh, by intelligence. I mean intelligence as the capacity for realizing an underlying order. And, of course, that relates very powerfully to this idea. Now, it turns out that Trying to figure out, that sounds very trite and truistic, and oh yeah, so what, big insight there. Intelligence is about realizing an underlying order. Would be. Okay, well, it turns out that when you're involved in cognitive science, that, that's actually a really, really hard and difficult problem. Because one, one of the aspects of cognitive science is the attempt to connect psychology and neuroscience to artificial intelligence, which is the project of trying to make machines that actually exhibit intelligence. And one of the really humbling things to do with any of your theories of intelligence is to try and give it to a machine because you very quickly realize how wrong you are. And that has been uh, quite enlightening. And as you are probably aware, we have a startling <coughs> lack of genuine artificial intelligence. One of my hobbies is to sort of watch the dates go by when science fiction has predicted that we would have general intelligence, HAL from 2001 was supposed to be turned on in 1999. We're now 10 years past HAL's. Uh, uh, Skynet from the Terminator movies is 2000, I think. And so we're passing all these dates in which we're supposed to have in, in, uh, artificial intelligence, and we don't have anything uh, remotely approaching that. Now, this has largely been going on, even though our machines are gaining capacity, speed, and um, memory storage tenfold every decade. So you're seeing this technological arc going like this, and yet progress on actually producing artificial intelligence has been almost zilch, and only recently is starting to take off. So it turns out that what's going on in intelligence is a lot harder than we sort of intuitively think it is. And let me try and show you why. I want to show you some of the fundamental problems that come out uh, when you try and get a handle on intelligence. And if you, if you be patient with me, this will actually get us back to a deeper understanding of this. All right. So one of the long-standing ways of trying to understand intelligence is as the capacity for solving problems. Again, that seems relatively uh, straightforward and easy. And for the longest time, people thought 
most, there's not that much work that we have to put into understanding how we solve problems. We all sort of know what we do. Uh, we just sort of describe it a bit. And then some really important work was done beginning in the 50s and running through the 70s by Newell and Simon. They actually got Nobel Prize, uh, not for cognitive science or psychology. You can't get a Nobel Prize in cognitive science or, or psychology. Uh, I believe they got it in economics. I don't know how they decide that economics is a science and uh, cognitive <laughs> science isn't. I'd like to see the reasoning behind that, but anyways. Um, sorry, a little bit of professional jealousy there. Okay, so what they did, Newell and Simon, is they were the first people to really give a formalization of what problem solving looks like. And by doing that, they revealed some very uh, important ideas that had, had uh, until then, had not been really explicitly understood. So one of the things that Newell and Simon argued for is, right, so this is what solving a problem looks like. You have your initial state, you know, I'm hungry, and I have my goal state. I don't want to be hungry anymore. Okay, now, what I can do is I can do a bunch of actions that will change my initial state into some other state. So one of the things I can do is jump. That doesn't immediately um, move me closer to food, but I mean, if there's an apple right above me hanging from a tree, it might be the relevant thing to do. And then, of course, the idea is that, you know, each one of these places I can do other actions, right? And eventually what happens is there is a particular pathway which will transform the goal state, sorry, the initial state into the goal state. And so what it is to, to solve a problem is to find the sequence of transformations that will take you from the initial state to the goal state. Again, this seems quite intuitive. Most people will go, yeah, so what? Well, here's where the so what appears. If you pay attention to this, in order to figure out which pathway I should search, I have to look, right, and compare the various alternative pathways that are available to me because not all of them, in fact, many of them don't lead from the initial state to the goal state. Now, I can actually calculate how many alternative pathways are available to me. The formula is f to the d, where f is how many operations I have available at any step, and d is the number of steps I'm going to go through. So let's take a concrete example of this. I'm going to play a game of chess. So, at any time, I usually, at any turn, there's about 30 moves available to me, 30 legal things I can do. Now, many of them are stupid, like I can move this pawn. Right? But they're all legal. None of them violate the rules of chess. They would all constitute playing chess, right? And typically, there's 60 turns. Now, that's how many alternative pathways there are. That's a really big number, isn't it? So when my co-author and I, Tim Lillicraft, uh, wrote a, a, a recent paper on relevance realization. Uh, we did some comparisons. This is greater than the. This is greater than the purported. I don't know how they can actually calculate this, but this is according to the physicists. This is a number bigger than the number of electrons in the universe. <laughs> and you see why having machines that just go really, really fast isn't going to solve this problem. Okay, because let's say you got a machine that's you know happening a millionth of a second. It's still going to take you the rest of the t life of the universe to figure out this problem. Okay. Now, that brought up something really, really pure. Now, this fact is called combinatorial explosion. <coughs> and it faces you no matter what problems you're trying to solve. Now, what becomes very clear right away is the following fact. Say, say this is the, the, the whole search space. That represents all the alternative pathways. You can't, you can't search most of these. That you have to somehow do the following. You have to search a very small subsection of them. Now, what's really interesting about you and what's really difficult for artificial intelligence is the following. You manage to not search most of this in a reliable number of times because you're pretty smart, right? You actually search this part of the search space where the goal state can be found. So somehow, and this sounds like a paradox, almost like a Zen Cohen, you have to intelligently ignore all of these possibilities. Why do I say intelligently? Because sometimes if you initially ignore a possibility, you might have to go back and check it out. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me give you another version 
of this problem. Okay? 